Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the executive director of the Sheen Center, William Spencer Riley. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you and to all the many people watching us tonight on television. Before we get started, I should mention that we have lots coming up here in the spring in the Sheen Center. Uh, in particular, the centerpiece of our spring season will be the American premiere of a hit show from London called All Our Children. It's a, um, an extraordinary piece that we're so lucky to give the off-Broadway premiere to. It's set in Nazi Germany in 1941. And a bit about it. A terrible crime is taking place in a clinic for disabled children. The perpetrators argue that it will help struggling parents and lift the financial burden of the mighty German state. One brave voice is raised in objection. But will anyone listen? Stephen Unwin's riveting drama memorializes the 200,000 children and young people who died as part of this overlooked chapter of the Holocaust, and the brave few who fought against this injustice. Enter Bishop Clems von Gallen. That's all I'm going to tell you. The show runs from April the 6th to May the 12th. I can't recommend this enough. What was a hit in London, I am certain, will be a great hit in New York City. And I'm particularly pleased to announce tonight that starring in this production um, is Tony Award winner and TV star John Glover. So come to all our children. And our spring brochure, they'll be coming out very soon in early January. There'll be over 100 events here at the Sheen Center in the spring alone. And if you want to know more about that and information, just send an email to info at sheencenter.org. And I'm particularly pleased tonight to, to announce that in the fall, we'll be launching another new series, somewhat similar to Civility in America, called Virtue in America, moderated by Catherine Lopez, the editor-at-large of National Review magazine. Tonight is actually a dark night in this theater, although with a sold-out house, it hardly seems so. You're actually on the set of All is Calm, The Christmas Truce of 1914, a hit play that's now running at the Sheen Center through December the 30th, which I've never been involved with a show that every single review was a rave, including, including from the all-powerful New York Times. And just yesterday, TDF hailed it on its cover as a Christmas show that makes you think. And speaking of making you think, that's at the core of what we do at the Sheen Center and what we're here specifically to do tonight. So tonight, civility in America, round two. I think now more than ever, civility in America is not only needed, but it's something which is on everybody's mind. Last year when we started Civility in America, we did it on religion, and we had Father Jim Martin and Ross Douthat of the New York Times come together. But tonight's subject moves from religion to higher education. And since last year, I believe the timeliness of this subject is even more needed Obviously, not just with what's going on in our country, but what's going on in our culture, in our church, and on our campuses. The vast majority of you in the audience are well past your undergraduate years, but the future of higher education in America is also in this audience tonight. There are teachers and students from Xavier High School, Regis High School, Loyola, Iona Prep, Cathedral High School, and Ursuline Academy. They're all with us as well, and I hope you students and teachers leave here tonight more inclined to want to debate the big issues of the day, but do so civilly. When I first had this idea last year to launch Civility in America, the very first person I reached out to and called was Father Matt Malone. I said, he's the guy who can make this happen in an extraordinarily powerful way, and I thought, who better to partner with for the Sheen Center than Father Malone in America Media? And before I bring Father Malone out, to put the entire series in context, I'd like to show you a very short video clip of the first episode of Civility in America, which dealt with Catholicism. When I learned that Ross Douthat and Father Jim Martin had been waging an internet battle, albeit a civil one, over major issues in, in the church and in Catholicism, I called Father Malone and said, let's bring these men together live on stage, and you can be the referee. I thought I would come out with some conclusions and really what happened is I got more food for thought. My 
motivation on Twitter and Facebook and, and, and in America Magazine and other articles is not to get people to vote Democrat, period. That is not my goal. My motivation is really to get them to encounter Jesus. It would be the same kinds of things that I, I, I consider it the same way that I consider a homily. And that a homily may have certain political implications or overtones, but it is about the gospel, just as the stuff that Jesus said in his times had certain political implications that he was okay with. There are very important questions up for debate that have, I think, implications in many cases that go well beyond sort of the particular, you know, divorce and remarriage and communion question. To what extent should Roman Catholicism imitate the trajectory of the Episcopal Church in the United States, and to what extent should it not? As a Catholic and as a Christian, I think it's very important to be charitable to people uh, in terms of your discourse, and uh, part of being a good Christian is being loving and also listening to people you might disagree with. I think that being able to not just have a sort of respectful dialogue, but have an actual respectful argument over these issues and to figure out what are the actual divisions within the church and what they mean for our common life as Catholics is an incredibly useful, if often difficult, project. I think it was a, a real tonic to your spirit uh, in this particular period that we're living through right now in our country. Beautifully balanced talk and very valuable, I thought. It was refreshing to hear them uh, speak about distinctive points of view, progressive, and more thoughtfully conservative, and how both those positions jockey for understanding and belief in today's American Catholicism. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sheen Center board member and the editor-in-chief of America Magazine, Father Matt Malone. Good evening, my brothers and sisters, and uh, welcome to the Sheen Center and to the second part of Civility in America, sponsored by America Media. Thank you to uh, Bill Riley for that warm welcome. Um, and I would also like to thank those who are tuning in via live stream uh, throughout the United States. Uh, America Media is really proud to partner with the Sheen Center on this occasion and uh, uh, to lead the conversation on civility and the public discourse in the United States. So just over a year ago, America and the Sheen Center launched the Civility in America series with the aim of helping to restore civility uh, to the mainstream American public discourse by bringing individuals together on this stage who uh, may be unaccustomed to sharing space together or may vigorously disagree about political, social, uh, or theological issues. Uh, leaders in media, religion, the academy, public life, um, those who are helping to lead uh, the public discourse. As Arthur Brooks, the president of the American Enterprise Institute, said on this very stage three months ago when we hosted him for the John Courtney Murray lecture, people may disagree with you, but they're not stupid and they're not evil. And it is only in bringing voices together that we can continue to build a better, certainly a better church, but a better public discourse. I am delighted to welcome our two guests here this evening. Robert P. George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton University. He is also frequently a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. In addition to his academic work, Professor George has served as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and he has served on the President's Council on Bioethics as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights and as the U.S. member of UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Science and Technology. Professor Cornell West is a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University and holds the title of Professor Emeritus at Princeton University. He is also taught at Union Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, the University of Paris. Professor West graduated magna cum laude from Harvard and obtained his MA and PhD in philosophy at Princeton. He has written 20 books and has edited 13. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Cornell West and Professor Robert George.
So, where to begin? I suppose to be, we might begin at the beginning. Um, so how did two men who have uh, different philosophies or perhaps even different theologies, different worldviews, come to co-teach a course together at Princeton University? Over to me. <laughs> Good to meet well, first, I know I speak for Good. Cornell as well as myself in saying how honored we are and grateful to have the opportunity to be here at the Sheen Center. Uh, it was wonderful to learn about the work that the center is doing. It's obviously very important work. If anyone knows anything about what Cornell and I do together, uh, we regard it as the Lord's own uh, work. Yeah. So congratulations and uh, thanks to you, uh, Father, and the entire uh, team at the Sheen Center for the work that you are doing. I uh, very much like this rug. If it disappears tonight, don't send the police to my <laughs> uh, Well, back to the beginning, Cornell. Mm. Uh, so uh, Brother West and I knew each other as colleagues at Princeton, but not well. We'd been in some faculty seminars uh, together. We could say hello to each other when we passed each other mm -hmm. uh, on the street. Uh, we had some students uh, in common, some wonderful yeah, yeah. Uh, students, and that becomes a, an element of the story in a moment. So one day in uh, 2006, one of our students, a brilliant young man, religion major, mm. Cornell was in the religion department, mm -hmm. uh, religion major named Andrew Perlmutter, oh, Andrew. Uh, who had studied with Cornell, had studied uh, with me, knocked on the door of my office and uh, said, uh, Professor George, can I have a word with you? And I said, certainly. He said, now some of us have uh, raised some money, and Princeton University is very good at raising money. <laughs> and, and I now know why, it's because it admits students who are really good at raising money. Right. And uh, the students had raised money for a magazine, a new magazine, they were gonna call it The Green Light. Yeah, yeah, uh, at the and, Great uh, Gatsby. That's right. That was Scott Fitzgerald. Very Princetonian. So, he only lasted a year, drank too much, we'll go right ahead. <laughs> that's right. So uh, he said, well, the um, magazine is going to feature in each issue, including the inaugural issue, which I'm here to talk with you about, uh, an interview by one professor of another professor. So um, I said, well, that sounds interesting. And he said, well, for our first issue, we've invited Professor Cornell West to be the interviewer. And we asked him <coughs> if we would like to interview him. <coughs> And he said he would like to interview you. Would you be willing to be interviewed for our magazine by Professor West? And I said, well, now, let me just get this straight, Andrew. <laughs> Religion major now. Brilliant. I said, uh, you're going to have an interview of one professor by another professor. And you've asked Professor West to be the interview and said he could interview anybody in this entire university he wanted to interview, any faculty member. And he wanted to interview me. And Andrew says, yes. And I said, will you send a message for me to Professor West? I want you to tell Professor West that Professor George says that it is I who should be seeking baptism from you. <laughs> <laughs> to which Andrew replies, huh? <laughs> but, <laughs> and I said, you just tell Professor West that. Uh, he'll know what I mean. Uh, and he said, well, okay, I'll tell him that, but will you do it? And I said, of course I'll do it. I'd be honored uh, yeah. to be interviewed by Professor West. So uh, the day came, we, we fixed the date, and the day came, and here came Andrew with one of those old-fashioned cassette Ooh. tape recorders. The technology has moved on since then. Right. Uh, had a tape recorder, and he had a photographer with him, and we were up at my office, and uh, we were supposed to go for an hour. Mm -hmm. you know, he had the cassette tape that he'd flip in the middle. Uh, so we went for an hour, and that was the, the, the amount of tape we had, but by this point, the two of us were into it. So we went on for three more hours, so we had four hours. Mm. And then I said, I looked at my watch, and I think it was about 6 o'clock, and I said, well, Brother Cornell, I'm going to have to go home for dinner now. It's been wonderful talking. You know, it's a shame. We've had been here for years well, together, really not gotten to know each other, but we need to get together and get to know each other better. This has really been wonderful. And Cornell said, oh, yes, we absolutely have to do that. And uh, I said, well, let's walk down. I'm, I'm parked down here. Let's walk down to my car. So we walked down to my car where... I put my hand on the door latch and held it there for a half hour while we continued <laughs> to debate and argue and talk. That's right. Uh, and and uh, finally, I forced myself, because I was enjoying it so much, to, uh, to go home. Well, then, about a week later, uh, we got some of the senior faculty members got a note from the dean of the college, Nancy Malkiel saying we have this freshman seminar program. It's a very important part of our program here at Princeton. We want freshmen to be exposed to 
uh, our senior faculty in small groups so people get to know each other. Uh, but we don't have enough senior professors uh, signing up to teach these seminars. Right. We'd really want to encourage you to do this. This is very important to the university. Well, then the light bulb went off, and I th thought to myself, what a wonderful thing it would be if Cornell and I could get together with 16 or 18 of these brilliant Princeton mm. freshmen and choose some texts, interesting texts that were important to both of us, uh, and just keep this discussion dialogue uh, going. So uh, I got in touch with Cornell and proposed the idea, and he immediately said, let's do it. <laughs> and so we got back in touch with the dean of the college, and uh, she seemed to be very happy with the idea. And so um, we went forward, and, and Cornell chose six texts, and I chose six great texts from the tradition. Uh, Plato's Gorgias was one of them. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, St. Augustine's Confessions. Uh, Cor Cornell introduced me to, uh, he's a Baptist, Cornell uh, <laughs> introduced me to Martin Luther's Babylonian Captivity of the Church, which I had never uh, read, you know, being Catholic. Right. I, uh, had ne it's probably on the index, but uh, <laughs> still I, on the index. I hadn't read, yeah, that's right. Even though they've abolished the index, it's right. still on the index. Yeah, imaginary uh, index. So I, I hadn't read that before, but it, uh, it showed me for the first time how the Reformation happened. Yeah. The power of Luther's polemic taught me. I, I was a learner in that seminar, mm -hmm. a learner from a lot of what Cornell said, and I was also a learner from reading some of these, uh, some of these texts. Um, and it was just a tremendous experience teaching with Cornell. I mean, you think the guy's good as a lecturer. You should see him in the, uh, in the classroom. And it was yeah. fantastic, just a fantastic uh, experience. And so based on that, we just continued doing it until he abandoned me and left for Union Theological uh, Seminary, I, despite my best efforts to try to talk about it. But then he came back and taught with me again, actually, as, as, a, visiting, as a visiting professor back at Princeton. So that's how it uh, happened. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, wh why, of all of the faculty at Princeton, why did you want to interview Professor George? Well, I just thought it would be a wonderful thing to get to know the brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I could see that he has, then and now, a profound commitment to the life of the mind. And so I, there would be an intellectual joy in engaging someone who one not only disagrees with, but one can learn from. Right. I've always thought that one of the most uh, beautiful things about relating to each other is giving us the benefit of being wrong as well as right. Sometimes he's wrong, sometimes he's right. <laughs> sometimes I'm wrong, sometimes I'm right. Now we both do we more right than, <laughs> than wrong, but we're fallible and we're falling. And, and uh, in, in addition, though, he, he, just his philosophical uh, um, ac acumen was just so intense. And so we've mm. had such great times. We're 12 years now yeah. teaching uh, courses together, traveling all around the, the country. We've been on the chocolate side of Dallas yeah. With, uh, with, 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 with black students engaging in paideia, which is to say this deep education, engaging in critical engagement with, with, with texts. We've been in Texas with the wealth. We've been, what at the Air, Air, Force, Air Force. Force Academy. You know, that's not the place I'm used to being. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I've got a martial spirit like they do, but I've got a different kind of battlefield. I'll tell you, though, they, the, the students there appreciated having Cornell. We, they we, were very respectful. We, we very had good. a wonderful, and, and, I, and I learned, I mean, the important thing is that we just learn from one, one another. And, uh, and in addition to that, too, what has happened is that we formed such a genuine friendship. Hmm. Now, I've always known that, uh, that love is not reducible to politics. And we need to hear this over and over again these days, given the levels of polarization, given the levels of balkanization in the country. And I salute the Shane Center for thought, and we ought to underline that thought there, because we live in an anti-intellectual culture. And so those who are willing to muster the courage to think critically for yourself and land where you land, just like a jazz musician, find your voice, not imitate, not fit in conformity, find your voice, that's where that thought is. And of course, you know, the Catholic tradition. Some of my favorite Catholics, Pascal and Montaigne and Dorothy Day. These are serious love warriors and thinkers. Yeah. And that's exactly what we've been able to do together for these, for these 12 years. And then our families became very close. Oh, yeah. And so you end up with not just a friendship, but a coming together 
of families and traditions and, uh, and, 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 and across the color line too. Yeah. And that's important. We don't really have to worry about that too much in our own friendship. But when people look at us and say, what are these two brothers doing together? <laughs> it's a little like Felix and Oscar, yeah. Exactly. Little... And so he's on the left, he's on the well, we're all so Christians too. Right. And that makes a difference. You know, you never want to reduce the specificity of the good news to just a political orientation. You see, yeah. you got to have some sense of what that love really means on that cross. Sure. And as a Baptist, I've got a less sacramental conception of the world, so I learned from his sacramental sensibility. Not enough yet, but you're no, no, I'm working on it. Though. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Absolutely. Right. And he learns from my tradition, which is a tradition of a people who have been hated chronically for 400 years to talk to the world so much about how to love right. and what love is really about. We can just put on John Coltrane, Love Supreme together yeah. and take it in. We oh, do some listening. Oh, oh and yeah, he plays a listen. serious guitar and banjo. We mm -hmm. sing together in class. Yeah, we Some, <laughs> Sometimes in tune, sometimes out of tune. You always in tune, and I'm trying to catch up with you. But you know, with that tradition yeah. of Aretha Franklin and then Stevie Wonder and... Uh, well, you know, when, when, uh, when Arthur Brooks was here giving the Murray Lecture, he yeah. said that this series is inaptly named, that it's not civility that we really lack in our public discourse, it's, it's love. That's what's really lacking. He said, you know, if you ask somebody, uh, you know, how, how is your marriage? And they replied, well, we're civil, <laughs> <laughs> right? But that's not a definition of success, right? Um, no, so it, it, <laughs> there's something to that, isn't there? But I mean, the great Hannah Arento taught right down the street here at the new school, the magnificent new school. She was very suspicious of any talk about love in the public square precisely because of the variety and heterogeneity of viewpoints. Mm -hmm. So as Christians, we can enter in with our love baggage on the love train. Mm -hmm. But we've got some magnificent secular and agnostic and atheistic brothers and sisters. They don't want to hear that love talk yeah. because it's been a cover for so much domination. Mm -hmm. It's been a cover for so much exploitation, you see. Mm -hmm. So we say, okay, if justice is what love looks like in public, let's talk about justice. They say, yeah, let's talk about justice. Mm -hmm. But from a Christian point of view, we're connecting it to mm. the cross, the witness of a Palestinian Jew named Jesus. For them, they're connecting it to discourses well, of benevolence yeah, yeah. or a whole host of other ways. And, and that's fine because as citizens, we enter that public square without humiliation, trying to respect people who we disagree with. And so if you come in talking about love too prematurely, mm. the important things for Christians is not to talk about it, but exemplify it. Mm. You see, you don't even want to talk about it. You talk about love, oh, no, I don't know, but I'm trying to love you. Yeah. <laughs> Watch this, yeah. year after year after year. And then finally, 15 years later, you say, now let's talk about love. Yeah. So you got yeah, something yeah. concrete yeah. that's already been fleshified in front of their own very eyes. Something else that we uh, have in common relates to that point, and, and uh, that is we do believe that eventually the conversation does have to come around to love. Mm. It does. Uh, you have to bear witness to truth in love mm. and the truth mm. about love and the primacy of love. And we don't think you can permanently lay aside the question of the ultimate source and ground of our humanity and of the possibility of love. Mm -hmm. So that's we're not among true. those. We're, we're willing to engage our secular brothers and sisters uh, on fair terms, in a spirit of brotherhood, in a spirit of love. We want to try to exemplify. We try, we fail, but we try again. Absolutely. But we are not of the school that says, keep religion in the closet, keep oh. God in the closet. Don't talk about that stuff. We're both bearing witness to our faith. We, we're, we're not of the mind that says, keep faith out of the public square, keep faith out of the public dialogue, only talk in a language that is common ground. The trouble there is you reduce to the point where you're not talking to each other at all. The common language is not capable of reaching the fundamental issues that have to be addressed, the deep existential issues of 
meaning and value because at the end of the day, right. people do want to know why should I love somebody else, especially if I disagree with them and I find their views or something about them disgusting mm. or appalling because there are this or there are that. And so we have to be willing to engage that and take it on. And it's hard. It's not easy at all. The temptation is to run away from it, to just get peace, mm. just get peace, not, mm -hmm. not engage. But I think the Christian faith is the ground of, of the possibility in our case, others have a different faith, but in our case, the possibility of mustering the courage to have somewhat uncomfortable well, conversations mm -hmm. about deep issues, really deep issues that people don't always want to talk about. Mm, absolutely. I think we do have to draw a distinction though between religion and politics. There is no religion that doesn't have political consequences right. and effects. Uh, uh, but you can have a nation state that treats fellow citizens equally so that Christians, yes. Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Hindus, agnostics, and atheists, and latitudinarians or whatever other categories we have in, in, in place, they can still enter the public square and have exactly the same status. Mm -hmm. But as Christians, I think, you know, we, and I don't speak on our behalf all the time, but I think we want to say that when we enter, we have our own assumptions and presuppositions that we're bringing. We're having a lens through which we look at the world. To look at the world through the lens of the cross is a very different way of looking at the world than through the lens of the stock market. But I think you, the lens of mm -hmm. just the laboratory or scientific authority. All of these might have a place, but the primary lens is through that cross that yeah. signifies that unarmed truth and unconditional love across the board and the willingness to live and die in light of a witness of a Palestinian Jew who was crushed by the Roman Empire but somehow bounced back with some love drops. Mm. <laughs> at the bottom of that yeah. cross, that precious fountain you see that, that the church has been trying to come to terms. Now we know the church is founded on Peter. That's not too encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> Three times they denied that. <laughs> so you have relatively low expectations <laughs> of institutional religion, but somehow even the institutional religion provides a means for that love to be available. Now, of course, Chesterton used to say what? Peter denied him, but he also acknowledged the denial. He didn't deny that he denied him. Yeah. That's part of Peter's bounce back. So that his bones sit at the foundation of this flawed and fallible institution. Yeah. called the church is, of course, in terms of its plurality. Now, there's a, I would imagine that one of the reasons why you're also a popular twosome on the circuit is uh, because I think we're all, whether we know it or not, uh, desperate for mm. a, a different kind of discourse than what we see in the evening cable news and certainly in the, on, on Twitter and social media and all the rest. Uh, but, I mean, how unusual is this in the academy? I, because I think that's probably another reason mm -hmm. why, why you two are popular, uh, because I, to, to a general audience, because it, it, people's perception anyway is that uh, either the, everyone in the academy thinks alike uh, or subscribes to the same sort of worldview, political worldview especially, um, and that these kinds of dialogues don't really take place. There's a serious issue there. Mm. Um, yeah. uh, the yeah. president of my university yeah. has been very uh, firm about the need to take it on. Uh, so has President Zimmer at the University of Chicago and some other uh, leading figures in higher education. The serious issue is the lack of viewpoint diversity uh, in the mainstream academic uh, world. Uh, too often it is an intellectual or political uh, monoculture. Orthodoxies. Uh, form and sometimes those orthodoxies harden and that creates a kind of groupthink which is possible even among the most brilliant people. Any of us can fall into groupthink if there isn't a Socrates around, if there's not a gadfly, if there's not someone poking and raising uh, questions. Uh, so I think that has to be addressed. I mean if, uh, if these partnerships uh, that I've been blessed to have with Cornell uh, are to uh, be more common 
then you're going to need people to be Cornell's conversation partner. Mm -hmm. And if they're not mm -hmm. there in your institution because there aren't uh, more conservative voices represented, yeah. those conversations can't take place. And everybody loses in that. I mean, groupthink doesn't benefit anybody. It doesn't advance the cause of learning, the cause of knowledge, the cause of scholarship. It certainly doesn't cause, uh, benefit, the, uh, benefit the students. So there's a real issue there, and it does have to be addressed. Uh, beyond that, I think it's important to lead by example. Once again, uh, Cornell is right when he says, we have to exemplify our Christian faith, faith more than preach it. I think we have to practice this kind of dialogical engagement more than we have to preach it. Mm. Uh, I think right. on the Princeton campus, right. uh, to the extent that we've been able to benefit the institution, it's just been in the doing, right. not in out there talking about what we're doing, it's the actual doing of it that has, that has made a difference. One good thing about it is that it's shown that it really is possible and it has benefits. Right. And I can't stress enough that this is not just about being polite to each other despite disagreeing. I mean, if that's the best we could do, I'd settle for it, but I'd be very disappointed. It's certainly better than, than, than going to war with each other. But we can do so much better than that. We can engage each other. We can try to learn from each other. We can acknowledge our own fallibility and the possibility that we might be wrong, whatever our view is about religion, about politics, about morality, whatever it is, and be open to learning from the engagement with the other person. Mm. It's, it's not just being nice for the sake of being nice. We can do so much better than that. We can advance the cause of learning. And to go beyond, we're, we're here this evening to talk about higher education, but if I can just step beyond it for a moment, sure. mm -hmm. if we do this, we'll not only benefit the cause of learning, we'll benefit the cause of democracy. Mm. You can't run a democratic republic if people are not willing seriously to engage each other and learn from each other and treat each other respectfully, not just out of polytest, but out of a desire to advance the common good, you're not gonna be able to run a Republican democracy if people are not willing to do that. James Madison in the 10th Federalist Paper warns that what brings down democracies has always brought down, what he uses, he favors the term republic. What has brought down republics historically has been faction and you have to find a way to deal with faction. He has a proposal for it in Federalist 10, the Constitution is meant in part to, to, uh, to come up with a way of dealing with that. Mm -hmm. But it's not just formal structures of government, constitutional structures uh, that are needed to do the work. You need a certain kind of citizen with a certain kind of virtue. Citizens who, despite disagreement, are willing to recognize each other as fellow citizens, as reasonable people of goodwill, to engage with each other, be willing to learn from each other, be willing occasionally, believe it or not, I know it sounds radical, to change your mind. Right. And not just be dogmatic. Right. Absolutely. You agree with that characterization of the problem, Professor West? Brother Rodby is right there. 120 percent, but he's, that's not always the case, <laughs> <laughs> but he's right there. You know, the great Du Bois says in Souls of Black Folk that honest criticism is the soul of democracy. And what, what he means by that is, is that what the Greeks call paideia, which is that formation of attention, that cultivation of a critical self and the maturation of a loving soul, willing to raise one's voice. And that's the, the anthem of black people, right, is what lift every voice, which is already symbolic democratic action. Just like a jazz orchestra, you got to lift every voice, not an echo, but a voice that is distinctly, uniquely your own. Conclusions you reach owing to your own wrestling with what's inside and outside of you. But in addition, and it's here where I think um, John Dewey's great text, 1927, The Public and Its Problems, he says, if in fact there's no longer a civic virtue that facilitates critical reflection, mature maturation of a self, okay? mm. things public will be degraded and trashed. Public conversation, public education, public health care, all the things that sit at the center of a democratic project, and you lose your democracy. Now, one of the things about Brother Robbie and I in the university, and you tell me whether you agree with this, that, that, that helps us uh, uh, go against the grain is that neither one of us are liberals. And forms of liberalism are hegemonic in the university. 
He is a conservative Christian. I am a revolutionary Christian. <laughs> so when we look at liberalism, we say, oh, there's some wonderful elements there. We're against monarchy, too. We're for rights, too. We're for liberties, too. We're for markets under certain kind of regulations, too. But it seems to be so spiritually empty, it can be colonized by the market and hedonism and narcissism and greed in the name of liberalism. So a moral rot begins to set in. And you don't have any counter voices that have religious and non-religious sources left. See, if we were having a dialogue in the 1930s, it would be religious folk and communists and socialists. Because they were the ones who were willing to live and die for something bigger than them. They just found out they were living to live and to die for a gangster named Stalin. Uh-oh, wrong judgment. <laughs> but, they were willing to, but they were willing to fight wealth inequality, white supremacy, male supremacy, homophobia. I believe those are worthy of fighting against. You see, they're worthy of fighting. This is what Dorothy Day understood. They call her a communist. No, I'm a Christian. I'm going to mass this morning. But some of those communists accenting certain issues are something that the mainstream needs to come to terms with. So when Brother Robbie and I come together in university, we really are going against the grain and Socratic in that sense, right? yeah. refusing to conform to the hegemony of the day. Is that a fair characterization, you think? Well, the only thing I would say is, uh, the only thing I would change is that uh, I'm a revolutionary conservative Christian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that, I like that. I like that, and I've got conservative elements. I, I like to call them preservative, because I believe right. in tradition. <laughs> I believe traditions are inescapable, and we must preserve certain elements of tradition. The problem with conservative is, when it comes to order and hierarchy, they get too excited. <laughs> I'm a radical Democrat. I want accountability from below of anybody who's at the top, be it corporate elite, political elite, cultural elite, religious elite. I want accountability in the name of ordinary people. So when it comes to order and hierarchy, yes, under certain conditions. Now, is that a fair characterization of your well. concern? Well. <laughs> 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 when you say conservative revolution, yeah, I well, I, I like that idea you like of that bottom accountability up too. bottom up, but I don't like that big government up here. Well, no, I don't that's want the, I don't want yeah, too big a government. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure we don't have poverty no, well, running that, amuck, and our brothers I'm, and sisters I'm, out here looking for, for something to eat no. when all these other folk living like kings I'm, and queens. I'm for that, but I do want subsidiarity. I want yes. involvement. I oh, want oh, civil yes. society. I, when I'm civil society that. gets that's pushed true. out. Whether it's that's government true. or capital, you know, it, doesn't, it, it, it can come from economic plutocracy. You've heard uh, me on that, right? That's right. That's right. So uh, I don't care I where agree. it's coming from. I want flourishing institutions of civil society that play the primary role in health, education, and welfare. That doesn't mean government doesn't have a subsidiary role. That doesn't mean that right. uh, that 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 uh, we want a libertarian utopia. I'm against right. that as much as you are. Absolutely. But I do want flourishing institutions of civil society, and I worry when government usurps the yeah. authority and undermines the integrity of those institutions, be it family, church, and so like, I'm a Tocquevillian. Well, I'm, I'm a yeah. I don't know if you count Tocqueville as a conservative or a radical. Well, how would you? Alexis doesn't fit. Well, there. He doesn't fit. And I don't either. I, so that's good. I mean, we're a topo. A topo <laughs> means unclassifiable, unsubsumable. That's what right. he used to call Socrates. He's a topo. He doesn't fit. Yeah. Now, Jesus, who weeps, Socrates never cries. Very important. No tears with Socrates. Yeah. Right? Jesus weeps. He is also a topo. He doesn't fit under one particular school of thought, one ideology, one politics. Because the love that he exemplifies is too rich and too deep to be contained by any human construction having to do with ideology and politics. Right. But he tilts toward the weak. And these are our Jewish brothers and sisters. This is the great revolution in the species. The Hebrew scripture that says to be human is to spread hesed, steadfast love and loving kindness to the stranger, the motherless, the fatherless, the weak, the persecuted, the oppressed, the exploited. And Jesus comes directly out of that prophetic Judaic tradition, you see. So in that sense, the lens again through which one looks at the world begins with those catching hell in the language of Malcolm X. Yeah. Now see, that's a very different way of looking at the world when it comes to not just America, but every nation. 
That's why every flag is under the cross, including the American flag. You can get in trouble saying that. I say it all the time. <laughs> I say it all the time. You know, our, yeah. our, our old no friend. idolatry with me when it comes to any flag. Our old friend Richard John Newhouse, the late Roger, Richard John yeah, Newhouse, yeah, yes. God rest his soul. I know, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Newhouse always made the point that to be a nation under God is to be a nation under judgment. We should aspire to be, as our motto says, a nation under God. When, when Lincoln inserted those words into the Gettysburg Address, he was doing it for a reason. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. But that should trigger in all of us the recognition that we are a nation under judgment. We answer to a higher power. This is the great central point of Martin Luther King's Letter from Birmingham Jail. Yeah, yeah, and we teach where he said, which is one of the texts yeah, that, that yeah, we teach. Yeah, the uh, uh, King is at pains to point out that no one is firmer than he in his belief in law. Without law, the weak, the vulnerable, the despised would be defenseless against the powerful. We need law. Human law is good, but human law can go bad. And that means we have to recognize that there is a higher law, a natural law, or a law of God that is the reference point, the standard by which we judge the justice or injustice of the human law. So while our ordinary obligation is to obey the human law, where the human law is not in sync with the higher law, we not only are not under an obligation necessarily to obey it, often we would be under an obligation to Break it. Right. But that's right. only true if there is, in fact, a higher law. If there's nothing higher than the human, nothing right. higher than the human law, then King is really taking us down the wrong road, the road, as his critics claimed at the time, to anarchy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it would seem to me that the, um, it, it, in as much as God or faith or the rel religious tradition retreats from the public square uh, are, or, is, or, or is not welcome in the public square, our politics actually becomes more moralistic, doesn't it, in a sense? Because it is, uh, it's, we're, we are focused almost entirely on the here and now. Mm. And so our, if, 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 if we are cut off from the transcendent, as Charles Taylor says, right? Uh, in the world in which we're living today, then what is only here and now becomes all that much more important, doesn't it? Right, right but I'm not sure, though, brother, it would be moralistic. I think it would be more like Thrasymachus and Plato's Republic, as might makes right, as power dictates morality. Because even in a world without God, you still have some moral sensitiv mm. sensibilities of people. You still have higher ideals, mm -hmm. you know, like democracy, or like love of family. I mean, secular brothers and sisters, they can be as transcendent as they want without God. Yeah. But what they're transcending is the greed and the hatred and the envy and the resentment and the obsession with power. You see, that's Thrasymachus, and that's Socrates' opposition to Thrasymachus, you see. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, what happens is Unfortunately, when you have a highly marketized culture where the obsession is pecuniary gain and the preoccupation is the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. Because <laughs> it's survival of the slickest. That's Wall Street, there's White House, there's too much church, too many synagogues, too many mosques, too many universities. We are experiencing a spiritual blackout or whiteout, whatever you want to call it. Uh, precisely because the obsession with power and greed have pushed out moral sensibilities, be they secular or religious. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very, very dangerous moment. That's an opening to neo-fascism. Because neo-fascism will teach you what life is like and what a society is like when it's only about power. And there's no countervailing forces whatsoever with those dissenting voices either incarcerated are completely called into question and delegitimated, you see. And that's the real fear. Mm. And we're seeing it in Poland, we see it in Hungary, we see it in Brazil, we see it in the White House, we see it in, in, in Austria. More and more, as the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, 
nihilism is the major ecumenical movement of the time. Now that's Heschel 1965, and no religion is an island, that great lecture of his that he gave right across the street from Jewish Theological Seminary. What happens when the most powerful movement is the movement of power and greed and hatred and envy and resentment? See, that's the kind of moment we live in. And it can that's, be very much of the, oh, I think you would agree, it oh, can and be it comes in all much. colors, all genders, all that's sexual right, orientations, right. all national identities, all the way down. It can be of the left or of the right. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it's a yeah, human, you know, all too human been a affair. a lot of apologizing for Cuba, and you know what went on. Oh, Lord, uh, yes. Cuba, and you stood Lord, up against yes. it, and a lot of people on the left wouldn't join you in doing that. Uh, well, I'm you, a radical Democrat. Elites need to rotate. <laughs> <laughs> that's democracy. That, that's what democracy is about. And the point about Stalin is a good one. The yeah. point you made earlier about uh, Stalin is a good one. I mean, uh, the trouble, the danger for me, the danger is when religion is pushed out of the public square. I don't want it to be given special right, privileges. Right, right. But I right. want it to be able to compete on fair terms with secular Absolutely. ideologies. But when it's pushed to the margins, when it is privatized, when we go down the path of laicite, it's not that people will go without a religion or that religion will not play a role in the public square. A religion will enter that vacuum, but it will be a political religion. Right. It might be of the right and it might be of the left. But whether it's of the right or the left, the corpses will begin to pile high. Whether it is communism, on which the record is clear, or fascism, the corpses will begin to pile high. So there needs to be something better than that. Now, I agree with Absolutely. Cornell Absolutely. that I mean, I, we, everybody in this room knows wonderful atheists, morally upright unbelievers. That some of you may be. Uh, this is not a claim that you can't be moral if you're an atheist. That's right. My worry is that when we push our religious traditions out of the public square and not let them compete on uh, mm -hmm. fair terms, uh, what you will end up doing is living for as long as it lasts on the capital of our religious heritage. Right. And you can deplete that capital to the point where people no longer see what the point is or why we would conceivably have an obligation to worry about the welfare of others. Sheer benevolence, uninformed by conviction, is not enough to keep us, given our passions, mm. given the negative side of human, you Baptists are yeah. real good on that, oh, yeah. the yeah. negative side of human Absolutely. nature. Absolutely. There, you know, knowing that, 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 unless there's conviction behind emotion, then pretty soon we're going to turn to each other, we're going to turn on each other, and we're going to be very vicious uh, toward each other. And, and it won't matter whether that ideology is of the right or of, of the left. That viciousness will... will and it seems to me that I mean, this is a crucially important point, because if you are... Well, at, at, to what you were saying earlier, Professor yeah, West, yeah. as if you are, as Christians, we enter the public square with certain presuppositions and uh, ideas, uh, and one of them, of course, is that we live in a fallen world, right? Absolutely. And we got enough evidence. <laughs> that. Right. Yeah. So we live in a fallen world primarily and not, perhaps, and not, not an imperfect society, but a fallen world, right? That's right. right. And that is, that's a, those are very different ways of looking at the same reality, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. yeah. And, then, and, and the prescriptions that then come from that worldview, uh, those worldviews will differ. I, I think that's a profoundly important point. Uh, we, as Christians or as Jews, and I believe the, true, the same is true for Islam, I don't know it as well, but certainly for people of biblical faith, we know there is no perfecting of human nature. Human nature is going to be in the future what it has been in the past. We're not going to be able to change things to create the perfect communist man. Uh, society can't be perfected. Uh, we're not going to build a master race. Uh, all those ideas are uh, not only crazy, but deeply, deeply dangerous. We've already seen the record of people uh, who think that by the exercise of political power, making the right political choices, putting the right people in office, they'll perfect society or perfect mm -hmm. man or change human nature. The biblical faiths keep us grounded in the belief that we're working with flawed materials here. 
and we can't expect more than those materials can in the end deliver. And that the struggle for justice, for decency, for right, will be permanent. Our, if there, if, if there, is a, if, if there are another million generations, they will be struggling with these fundamental issues and the fundamental flaws in human nature and trying to overcome sinfulness in the same way we do. We cannot do things now that will make it the case that we've got the future perfect person or the future perfect society or the future perfect person because society is what perfects persons and the perfect society will create perfect persons. Do you agree with that? Oh, indeed. You know, the greatest American play ever written was about a bar right around the corner here. The Iceman Cometh mm. by the great Eugene O'Neill. You remember that line in that play, you can't make a marble temple out of a mixture of mud and manure. Right. <laughs> yeah. You see. But we can't allow imperfection to be used as an excuse not to fight for justice. You see, you have to be able to come to terms with the fallenness and the fallibility of we crack mortals and still muster the courage to follow and be lured by something greater than us. Some of us call it the kingdom of God. And coming out of my black Baptist tradition, where I was told every week if the kingdom of God is within you and everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. Mm -hmm. What kind of witness are you leaving in such a grim world in which th that we find ourselves inhabiting? Not in order to create this marble temple, not in order to overlook the flaws and foibles of who we are as human beings, but to be also willing to serve and sacrifice in order to bear witness to something inside of you, a fire inside of you that won't allow you to hold your peace. That's not a matter of somehow being on automatic when it comes to perfection or progress, you see. And it's a, uh, it's, it comes down to what W.H. Auden said when he said, well, how do we learn how to love our crooked neighbor with our crooked hearts? Yeah. So you get the self-criticism built in, but you also have the aspiration to make that love connection. But the love connection itself is going to be flawed. Yeah. So when it comes to white supremacy, how do you really learn how to love a hated people? How have a hated people learned how to love the people who hate them? Well, spend a little time with Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Spend a little time with some of those voices, the James Baldwin's and the others, you see. Now, that's not to say that we haven't had, uh, you know, black thugs and black, and black gangsters, because every community has had gangsters and thugs. And I was a gangster before I met Jesus. I'm just a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities right now. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing keeping me going is right. some connection to this kingdom, because the Civil War taking place on my own soul every day against the gangster proclivities. You see, that's why when I called Donald Trump a gangster on television, people said, oh, you shouldn't use that language. I said, no, I'm on intimate terms of what it is to be a gangster. <laughs> and I can tell a gangster when I see one. <laughs> but that's not a subjective expression. That's an objective condition. You don't grab women's, women's private parts and not be gangster-like. It's not just wrong, that's gangster-like. But he has the possibility of being changed, he is made in the image and likeness of God too, which makes him my brother. He's just my political foe. And if he's after me, I'm after him. Mm. But I'm after him in a different spirit than he's after me. You see, because I'm still loving him, even though he's having trouble loving himself. <laughs> you see, and he's not loving me too well. <laughs> but that's all right. He has a capacity. He can change. I'm just not making my, project, my program on his change. Right. You see? So in that way, the specificity of the Christian witness must always be center stage. And that's what we have fun doing yeah. at a place like Princeton or so, so, so many of the other places that, that we've gone to. Be yeah, because you, you, you actually have a great deal more in common than one would think at first glance. Right? That's true. Um, That's very true. Beginning with a deep Christian faith. So but is you, that. So do you two guys. I like these black suits. Yeah. <laughs> Yours is sharp, but no brother. <laughs> black Yours is very is slimming, they tell me. So. <laughs> the, uh, but 
is that is this kind of discourse the kind of discourse we've just been having? Uh, you know that it's filled with this kind of religious symbolism language. Is that welcome on our university and college campuses? We've never really asked for permission. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know what I that's mean? That's true. Yeah, that's it's, true. We just so. come in bearing with. But clearly, it's the case that many people on the more conservative side of these issues uh, do not feel that they can safely state their opinions, that there will be mm. retaliation. Mm. Uh, if I write this on an examination or in a term paper, uh, my professor will give me a bad grade or give me a less good grade than I would have gotten uh, otherwise. Uh, I, I'll be completely marginalized. I will not get a recommendation for law school. Uh, mm. These are real fears mm. that people have yeah. and they are not uh, unreasonable. Um, uh, again, my, my president, the president of our university, uh, Chris Eisgruber, for, for whom I have enormous respect, Noticing this problem of a lack of viewpoint diversity has even put some emphasis on the idea of needing to recruit uh, students, not just faculty, that's another issue. It's very important to get more viewpoint diversity on our faculty, but to recruit students from parts of the country where, for example, Donald Trump is popular. Yeah. Appalachia, uh, the West, uh, some of the working, uh, white working class areas of the uh, industrial uh, states and, and so forth. And he wants a situation, and I want a situation, where, as it happens, I am a conservative Trump critic. But I agree with Chris Eisgruber, who is more on Cornell's side than on my side. I agree with him that I think it would be good for the university, for people who do support Donald Trump, to feel free to engage with people who are opposed to Donald Trump and are highly critical of Donald Trump in a robust civil dialogue. Uh, these people are not fools, they're not idiots, and it's wrong to dismiss them as, as bigots. Many of them are highly intelligent people. I know people on the left don't like to acknowledge that, but it's true, and they've got something to say, and I want to engage with them. Now, I'm on the other side, and I get a lot of heat. For you, you know my Twitter, Twitter I feed. Do, I, I get a lot of heat it. from the Trump <laughs> uh, people, yeah. uh, especially being a conservative who's a critic of, of Trump. But I myself have engaged with some of those people. And some have some powerful things to say. There are reasons that they went in the direction of Donald Trump, even acknowledging many of his personal uh, mm. uh, flaws. So I want to engage with mm. them, and I think it's important that we engage with them. And there are a range of other types of or, 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 uh, viewpoints. There are a range of other viewpoints that are not well represented on uh, college campuses that need a better representation if education is to prosper. I want to make clear, this is not just a matter of let's be fair to the conservatives. That's not the, fun I, it, it's nice to be fair to everybody, including the conservatives, but that's not what I'm fundamentally concerned about. What I'm fundamentally concerned about is truth seeking, education, learning, knowledge. You cannot have that unless there is some sort of robust engagement and dialogue. What I want is what Cornell described as paideia, that great Greek term for the concept of a deep education. Gotcha. An education is not just about conveying information or imparting skills. A deep education that wrestles with the fundamental questions, with the basic questions of meaning and value, which engages with the best that's been thought and said on competing sides, all the sides of the, uh, of the, of the various questions. And you can't have that when there's a monologue, when everybody is thinking too much alike. Right. Absolutely. Right. And we've seen this, though, with um, Brother Mark Lamont Hill yeah. and the speech that he gave here at the United Nations, yeah. where it's very, very difficult to have a candid and critical dialogue on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in the academy, outside in public discourse, on television, you see. And if we're going to have a robust discourse in which all of us are accountable, Brother Mark, He's got to be accountable. There's no doubt about that. But he's also got to be able to raise his voice without being so thoroughly demonized that people can't keep track of what he's also trying to say, which is that a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish baby. And a Jewish baby has the same value as a Palestinian baby. And therefore, when we talk about the situation, we got to have a double love perspective. We got to love our Jewish brothers and sisters. We got to love our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And how do you do that in such a way that you come up with an analysis, a vision, and a narrative? Now, no one has an answer to the latter question. 
But if we can't raise our voices and say, suffering among the Palestinians has a significance and status so that a Palestinian life lost is not something to dismiss and a Jewish-Israeli life loss is a catastrophe. It's a catastrophe across the board, especially when it's innocent, especially when it's children. Now, we can disagree, especially the last line that he says associated with Hamas. We know Hamas are gangsters. But there's always gangsters in resistance against oppression. You got to separate the gangsters from the legitimate voices are, who are concerned morally and spiritually with not just Palestinians, but also Jews. Mm -hmm. We've got that in the United States. Was there an urban guerrilla movement in the United States? The whole nation founded on that movement. It's called the American Revolution. Were they in love with the British? <laughs> <laughs> A few were, most weren't. <laughs> yeah. But they're just as wrong. There's a Jewish terrorist movement called Ergon that was killing Arab children and women and men. Right? Loss of an innocent life is wrong across the board. Across the board. Now, how do you enter into a dialogue that allows these kind of sensibilities and yet rendering each one of us answerable? And so in that situation, now Brother Robbie and I disagree about the Middle East, but he was willing to say, as a person committed to rights and liberties, he ought not to be dismissed at Temple University. He ought not be demonized in that way. You right. see. And that took a lot of courage, and he's, he's still receiving all kinds of, I can imagine, different well, yeah, I'm. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, uh, just one second. I know we have uh, time for some questions and some, oh, yeah, we're going some to take comments. So question. we have, uh, I believe there's a microphone here. And uh, so if you want to queue up, we'll get to you in just a second. I'm sorry, you want to say something? Professor? Well, yeah, I think Cornell's made some very important uh, uh, points there. I spoke up for Mark Lamont Hill's rights for the same reason I would speak up for anyone's rights to freedom of speech and academic freedom, not because I agree with what he said right. or agree right. with his position, but because I think he had a right to state his view and should not be retaliated against, especially by his university, which is a direct violation of academic freedom, uh, for expressing uh, uh, that view. I, 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 now, if he were asking me about the terms in which he should express that view, I would have given him some advice, probably the same advice Cornell would have given him, and he would have believed it from Cornell and maybe taken it. You know, that maybe you shouldn't use expressions that are associated with Hamas mm. and with terrorism against Jewish Israelis and others Jews around the world. Uh, but I'm willing to stand up for the free speech rights of anybody Who's being, whose free speech is being violated, whether I would agree with it or not. And that's because I believe that freedom of speech is absolutely crucial to truth-seeking, which is what universities are about, and to democracy, which is what we should be all about. Now, at Princeton, uh, on this question of divestment of, from businesses doing business in Israel, BDS, Cornell and I were on opposite sides. And uh, a few years ago, right. the two sides had their forums, and Cornell was the main speaker at, at, at the pro-BDS forum, and I was the main speaker at the anti-BDS forum. We have a disagreement about the politics of the Middle East. But we agree on fundamental things, like what he said. Palestinian baby, exactly equal to a Jewish baby. Yeah. Jewish baby, yeah. exactly equal to a Palestinian baby. Now, should there be a single state, or should there be two states? Should, should there be a Jewish homeland state, or not? You know, those are mm -hmm. points on yeah. which there are yeah. disagreement and, and argument. But even Cornell is going to be the first to say we can understand the reason that the Jewish community believes that they need and should have a national homeland in Palestine. Of course. We know what has happened to Jewish people throughout the world, really. Mm. We know what the, what, the, what the basis of that aspiration is. And we know a lot about the historical links between the Jewish people and that mm. part of the world. Now, none of that would justify oppression and none of that is to say, whatever any Israeli government does, we're going to approve of. Right. Mm -hmm. Because Israeli governments are just like American governments, or Cuban governments, or Hungarian governments, or any governments. They're made up of frail, fallible, pe fallible people, many of whom have an agenda. 
usually sometimes not such a good agenda, and so they're going to do things that are wrong. And we can, we can speak up against the wrongdoing, regardless of whether we're on this side or that side of the more fundamental question. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Oh, Toby. Hi. Um, my question is on the issue of civility. There have been times when we tried as a nation to be civil, and it hasn't worked because both of you have, have been active in different areas in prominent civil rights movements. For example, Professor West in race relations, Professor George from the pro-life movement, both of you perceive that to be pressing civil rights issues. And my question is, how do you love, and not just in your heart, but actively love people who are, who are choosing, because in the Judeo-Christian tradition, you have free will to do good and evil. God said, I place before you today good and evil. How do you um, engage with people. Because, for example, um, William Seward famously said that there was an irrepressible conflict in the nation, which led to four years of blood. And when we gave up the project, when we tried to be civil, Professor George posted about uh, Sherman and Johnston. They were the elites who tried to bridge their differences. We had 90 years of Jim Crow. Because we gave up, we said, let's be civil as a nation. Let's not fight anymore. Let's, you know, fiddle while Rome burns because we want to have civility. So how do you, not just, in your heart, you to love anyone. You can say, I recognize humanity. But how do you engage people who promote and advocate what you genuinely believe to be evil, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and not without being of the elites, because both of you are from humble beginnings, but you are prominent men, and there are real people who are suffering on whatever position you take. Um, you know, again, going back to Johnston and Sherman, they had the luxury of being civil because they weren't African American or Southern Unionist or whatever whatever side you're you're on position that how do you love that which is evil or okay. a person All right. which promotes evil? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do you want to take that on? It won't be to say. Well, let me give it a sure. start, and, and uh, yeah. then, then you'll Absolutely. actually explain the truth of the matter. Uh, <laughs> no, no, because no. Dovey, my friend Dovey no, Eisner, no. has has raised a, has just a powerful uh, question, and of course, I'm going to approach this through that lens of my Christian faith. Absolutely, and I can understand if someone doesn't have that Christian conviction. Uh, it's, it, it, they give a different answer, but here's here's my answer. My faith tells me that there are people who do evil, even grave, grave, horrible evil. But the person himself never loses his fundamental human dignity, which means my obligation is to love him. Now, if I love him, I also speak truth. That's what we mean by speaking truth in love. If I love him, I might actually have to oppose him. In fact, if I love him, might, might, we pray that it doesn't come to this. Think of Lincoln's first inaugural address, Dovey, mm. pleading with the South not to trigger a civil war. We might have to fight him for the sake of protecting innocent people who are vulnerable. But we do not give up on love. You know my wonderful, my great uh, former student, Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik, a fantastic uh, scholar and teacher uh, here in New York at Yeshiva. Um, he wrote a very powerful critique of the Christian idea of loving enemies 
uh, I believe it was in Commentary Magazine, it might have been in First Things ma Magazine, and, he, and he, got a lot of, he got a lot of pushback, especially from Christians on it, because he, he titled the article, The Virtue of Hate. And Rabbi Soloveitchik's argument was, there are some people who do things so bad, who are so th through and through themselves filled with hatred and ill will, and they manifest that in actually murdering innocent people, that they are not to be loved, they are no longer to be loved, it's not just the sin that is to be hated, but the person as the, as the sinner is to be uh, hated. Now, I can see, if you're not looking at it from my Christian perspective, that that's not a crazy view. But I look at it from the Christian perspective. And so I say something so radical that it, it, it really scandalized uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. Mm. And that is, we have an obligation even to love Hitler. Even Christians have a lot of trouble with that one. Although in theory, in theory, they're all going to affirm it. Because no Christian who's serious about his faith is going to be willing to say that there's somebody who's so bad that their human dignity has been erased and we have no longer any obligation to, mm -hmm. to, to love them. Right. Mm -hmm. No, but I think, I think that's real Christian witness, though, brother. The, the, the flip side of genuine Christian love is charitable Christian hatred. <laughs> Where you hate the sin and still try to love the sinner. You hate the injustice. Deep hate. We're not talking about just some nice little opposition while you're sipping tea at some <laughs> restaurant. Reading your New York Times. And, no, no, no. We're talking about something you wouldn't live and die for but you're not losing sight of the humanity of the person because their humanity is still on a continuum with you. you see. And you have the capacity without the good stuff inside of you of being gangster, thug, Hitler-like, white supremacist, male supremacist, homophobe, transphobe, anti-Semitic, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian, all that ugly stuff, what you call an evil. You see. The, the, now the reason why I think the Christian position is so powerful and this is what Martin Luther King understood, that when Jesus said, love your enemies, he said that precisely because if you really engage in a Christian witness, you're going to have so many of them. Mm. Yeah. And if you obsess with them, you never get to the point, which is bearing witness to the kingdom, keeping the love train going, keeping the justice train going. And in addition to that, if you're hating the sinner, you're just adding the more hate anyway. So there's more hatred, uh, hatred unleashed in the world. Much of the history of our species is the history of hatred and domination and exploitation. There hasn't been one moment in the history of our species where God could look at history and say, that is good. Not one moment. The, the democracies that we know, most of them have been imperial democracies. as indigenous peoples. Ask the Africans vis-a-vis European democracies, given their imperialism, or Latin America. They've been patriarchal democracies, as the vast majority of humankind women, sisters of all colors. They've been homophobic democracies. But these democratic practices, Murray understood this. You wrote a wonderful thesis on the great John Courtney Murray. These democratic practices are very fragile. They're very precious because democracy itself at its highest level is a form of a witness to love of truth and love of goodness and love of beauty. And those of us who also love God can play a role. But we also have a whole host of folk who in love with God who also in love with white supremacy, male supremacy, anti-Jewish, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sensibility. So this issue of loving the sinner is not liking the sinner, but simply saying, that person is made in the image of God, and no matter what their deeds are, their humanity is not fully exhausted in how vicious they are. That's true for Trump. Yeah. That's true for Trump. And people say, oh, well, Brother West, you're defending Trump. I'm not defending that, brother. <laughs> I'm keeping track of his humanity. Why? Because as a black man in America for 65 years, if I didn't keep track of the humanity of most vanilla brothers and sisters, yeah. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs>
I had a Presbyterian minister who put it to me uh, this way. He said uh, that in every person there are two Adams. There is the Adam who's created in the image and likeness of God, and there is the Adam who ate the fruit. That's and, powerful, brother. <laughs> That's powerful. Yeah. Dovey, the other point I would make is, uh, again, from a Christian uh, point of view, I think though this is this is defensible on more than merely more than theological terms. I don't want to say merely theological terms, Father. Uh, <laughs> on more than theological terms. <laughs> theology, of course, the queen of the sciences. I acknowledge that as a flaw. Uh, we were about to turn off your mic. <laughs> <laughs> people are capable of change. Even people yes. who are deeply into the worst kinds of things are capable of change. I think it was the the, the man who wrote Amazing Grace, who was a slave trader. Absolutely. I, I think I have that, the right guy. The writer of one of the great hymns, who was a slave trader, and yet he had a change of heart. He had a change of mind. He had a transformation. You, you've referenced the work I do and the witness I've tried to give in the pro-life movement, standing up for the child in the womb, the frail elderly person, the cognitively or physically disabled person. And of course, that's a very tough issue today, and we're in a lot of conflict with each other, and it can get very intense. But I never think that my job is to defeat my opponents there on that issue, as deeply as I care about the sanctity mm. of all human life. Mm. My job, I, I, I don't actually see them as enemies. I, I see them as future allies. <laughs> I, 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 I want a conversion of heart, and I've seen that in so many cases. I was a great friend, I think, as you know, Dovey, of of Bernard Nathanson, one of the founders of the National Abortion Rights Action uh, League, and in, in those days it was called the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion uh, Laws. And he was somebody who had supervised 60,000 abortions, uh, had performed several uh, thousand, including uh, one that took the life of his own unborn child. And yet, he ended up seeing differently, coming around, becoming a, 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 actually a pro-life activist uh, uh, himself. There are those conversions of heart. But whether or not we win an adversary over, we need to respect his humanity as someone who has ended up where he or she is for now, but could change, has within them the resources to, to get past whatever the impediment is that is blocking their seeing what is truly good as far as we can see. You know, I have to be open to the possibility that we might be the ones who are wrong, which is why we should engage the person. Listen to that person's arguments. Absolutely. There's no infallibility in any of us. Well, the Pope, uh, but uh, <laughs> within very... No, we love France, we love France. <laughs> we love France. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, it has to be a sincere engagement, not, not, not just advocacy, all the time advocacy. That's right. Yeah. We, we, need to be, we, we have no excuse for not fighting for justice, for the victims. No excuse for not doing that. But always willing to listen and not just to preach. Well, let's get one more question in. Uh, we have it. Yes, sir? Do you? I'm sorry? He was next. Oh, you're next. Go ahead, sir. Uh, as a uh, former teacher, I know there's some students in the back. Um, a lot of times as a teacher, the hardest thing that I had to do or try to do well was to make the content relatable to the students that I was teaching. And not dumbing it down, but putting it in terms that they could understand best. And one of the things that I'm curious about is how do you reconcile on campus the kind of language and terminology that's used in your conversations that you know well, definitions, philosophies, um, ways of thinking that's pretty high level to, so, to, um, to the masses, let's say, um, and reconciling that language with people who may not understand that language and engaging in that kind of dialogue. And that's something to me that I'm always thinking about as I'm hearing this political discourse of the coastal elites or these people who are intellectual elites and like, I'm, I have a master's degree, so I'm one of those people. And so I keep thinking, how, how are we supposed, or how can we, or what are the techniques that can reconcile just on the basis of language encountering somebody who, who may not understand just the words that I'm speaking? Mm, that's a wonderful question. Salute the work that you're doing. And it's just so wonderful to have the young brothers and sisters here of all colors. Uh, high schools, right? 
I yes, did the Edge used to teach high school, but now he works for me. Yeah, oh, that's, <laughs> that's, oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> no, but brother, I mean, the language we use of love, integrity, honesty, generosity, service to others, greed, envy, hatred, resentment, that's not the jargon of the chattering classes. Mm. That's very heavy, clear language that's still subject to multiple interpretations, but it gets at where young people are, because young people are so hungry and thirsty for something that transcends the superficial culture of spectacle, of image, of money. Young people are told every day, you are to be the smartest in the room and the richest. Now that's spiritually empty. Let the phones be smart, you be wise. <coughs> Love of wealth, empty. Now, I know you don't want to be broke of the Ten Commandments financially, <laughs> but if you start loving wealth more than you love truth and justice, you're going to run up against a stone wall and read your history and see it in every culture. See, that's what we tell our young folk. Now, I think most of the young folk get that. It's just that they don't hear it enough. They don't hear it enough because these monopolies and oligarchs these days, they're so obsessed with money making and so obsessed with their peacock status, want to be seen as the richest and the smartest with their trophy X's and their big mansions. And you say, my God, how vacuous can you get? And yet it's very seductive, especially the young folk who haven't undergone a paideia that gives them a strength to resist that. And we find this even among our colleagues. I mean, the, the neoliberal university has more and more colonized by big money. Is that, would you say that partly that's true? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm worried about, and you and I have worked on this uh, together, is that we're losing liberal arts education. Absolutely. And education is becoming more and more careerist and professionally oriented and vocationally uh, oriented. Uh, and so people who really would enormously benefit from reading Plato, St. Augustine, uh, the, the, the Reformation uh, authors, the Enlightenment uh, authors, uh, just for Shakespeare, Chaucer, just for the intrinsic enrichment, see those as a luxury that can't be afforded. Because right. to get where I want to go, I need to study economic, which is fine, computer science, which is fine. There's a place for that, it's all fine. But let's not neglect the liberal arts. Let's not neglect liberal arts education and the intrinsic enrichment that that brings. Let's not, let's not uh, uh, miss the opportunity to lead an examined life. Now, not everybody has the luxury of leading the examined life by, by uh, getting into dialogue with Plato or, or, or St. Augustine, but all of us can lead the examined life. All of us can ask the great questions. All of us can look for opportunities to engage people on great questions. Mm -hmm. Now, on the question of the pursuit of wealth, and there is an awful lot of the pursuit of wealth, that has become a big thing. But in my experience, people who are obsessed with wealth are not obsessed with wealth just for its own sake. It's not mm. technically greed. They're obsessed with wealth because in our society, wealth attaches to status, prestige, mm. social standing, and that is what people want. And underlying that is this whole idea that life is about gratification. It's about me, me, me. My generation, I regret to say, was called the me generation. The motto of the me generation, you'll remember this, was if it feels good, do it. Well, we're now living with a lot of the fallout of if it feels good, do it. And it's not just people who have ended up where Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix have ended up, mm, or people who've was, ended up with, yeah, you know, was, in a yeah. string of broken relationships and so forth. It's even people who've made it, but whose lives are impoverished and vacuous because they find out that the mansion and the Bentley and all that social status that comes with those things actually isn't worth very much. Mm. You get it and you wonder what was it all about. So I think we need to get people focused on the things that are really important, the things of the spirit, not, 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 and, and off of the me, me, me stuff. One more point mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. in response to your question. Um, one problem, and this, this may not be just our intellectual culture. I, I don't know enough to know whether this is just endemic to intellectual cultures. There is a, um, 
an unlovely tendency in the intellectual culture to look down on people who are not as well educated or fancily educated, who don't have degrees from the right places or don't have college degrees at all. That's true. Some of the finest, many of the finest people. Uh, in fact, I don't think that the best educated are on the whole any better or worse than people who are less well educated from a moral uh, point of view. I, I think education is valuable. I want as many people to have it. The, the, these days, it's, it's, it's popular to say, well, not everybody should go to college. That's probably true, but I think an awful lot of people would benefit from college, even if they go on to careers that didn't necessarily require a, a, a college uh, degree. But I think we should cut it out. Those, those who are in fields like the ones we're in should cut it out with looking down on yeah people who don't use the fancy terms that we use, haven't read the books that, uh, that we've read. There's too much condescension, condescension and sense of superiority and entitlement in the elite sectors of the culture more generally, but certainly in the uh, intellectual Absolutely. college. It's wrong, it's just wrong. Absolutely. And, and to, to James Baldwin never went to college, but two colleges went through him. <laughs> Genius from, from Harlem. Something about a commitment to paideia which is different than just matriculating through some university in order to gain access to a dog a, a diploma so you can live high and large in some vanilla suburb. Yeah. Not, not well, that I, there is anything wrong with Not that there's life. anything wrong no, with it. <laughs> well, it de <laughs> depends on what you're doing. If yeah, you're if well you're adapted to injustice what you're there, doing, exactly. if you're well adapted to indifference there, you need to be unsettled. Yeah. Uh, unsettling is good. Uh, but you can be well adjusted, well, well adjusted to the injustice right in the city, but we, right uh, in the hood, right in any working class community. But the pain and the suffering there will lead you to have a certain perspective toward the status quo. Whereas in that comfortable suburb, where it's, it's about convenience and status, you've got to read a whole lot of Chekhov and listen to some Sondheim to get some <laughs> critical sensibility. <laughs> Some of these artists will wake you up. <laughs> oh, indeed, yeah. Gene O'Neill will wake you up. Absolutely. I got, I got to rush. Getting, I got to rush to the defense of the of the of the suburbs. <laughs> <here. laughs> uh, because you know it is an honorable aspiration. Yes, yes. Of people to have a decent life. Uh, Absolutely. And, and for some people, the aspiration to 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 work hard, to build themselves up, to come out of circumstances that are tough Absolutely. and dangerous, to live in a place that, well, like Princeton, for example, which is a- Princeton's more in a suburb. a suburb. Yes, yeah, a technical um, burb. You know, is an, is an honorable thing. Now, yes. whether you are in the city, or whether you're in the suburbs, or whether you're in the countryside, if you're not allowing yourself to be unsettled by asking the great that's, questions, that's the by being challenged by other people, by being provoked, that's the by questioning your own political or moral uh, convictions, then we have a problem. That's yeah. true. But it's not having to do with it's being the suburbs or it's being vanilla. That's true. You got to take your integrity and courage wherever you go. Wherever you go. Wherever you go. It's going to be a challenge wherever you go. But the suburbs is a special kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong with some well, of I'm, I, liked, I liked this point about the, this, this language being uh, uh, immediately intelligible to hearts and minds. It's yes. Like, I mean, idolatrous, greed. Hate. These are words people understand. Right? And we try to use that language, yeah. though, don't we? Oh, absolutely. In that, in that, in that sense. Uh, and and that is a, that is a, a common light. language, right? Everybody, if, if, when, when parents try to bring up their children to be honest, to have integrity, absolutely. not to cheat on exams, uh, not to do drugs, when, when parents are doing that, they're, they're talking a universal common absolutely. language. Kind and what? gentle and sweet and generous. These yeah. are subversive notions and, in and a cold-hearted world. You, you word. don't need a Harvard education. To God, no, that's one of the last <laughs> things. Sometimes, because that reinforces the arrogance. Well, it's the learned the ignorance yeah. that needs to be shattered at these ruling class institutions like Harvard and Yale and Princeton. Hmm. Because they end up thinking that because they're so smart, which they often are, that that's enough. And that's the last thing they need to be told. That's the last thing they need to think when they graduate, and we try to remind them every semester. <laughs> that. I think we got one more question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brother Cornell, Joe Wilson. Oh, Brother Joe, how you doing, man? Oh, good, good, good. God, it's good to first, see uh, the distinguished scholar right here. Yeah, yeah. First quick comment, appreciate the love thy enemy framework, uh, but I think that also holds open the possibility that you want some of these 
arch criminals, you wish them a special place in hell. So that's, uh, that's one thought. But my, my You're question on the is. You're the side of that issue. <laughs> <laughs> my question is a little bit more mundane. How do you, with your moral perspective, how do you handicap some of the potential Democratic candidates and or Republican candidates from either side, you know, carrying this moral mantle that you see would really uplift uh, the public dialogue, uh, you know, the public, uh, public policy and so forth? Mm, appreciate that. Was that just for me or is that also nah, for Brother for Robin? Well, for me, well, as you know, I mean, for me, it has much to do with just trying to be true to the best of the legacy of Brother Martin Luther King Jr. So what are the tests? Poverty, militarism, racism in all of its forms, that includes homophobia and transphobia, it includes any anti-Jewish, anti-Arab sensibility called into question, but also materialism. So my question is, do they have a critique of oligarchs and plutocrats, beginning with Wall Street. That's what I loved about Brother Bernie. He introduced that into the public sphere in a powerful way. Secular brother, Jewish brother from Brooklyn, mediated with Vermont, comes with this critique. Boom, now the Democratic Party has hardly had such a critique since FDR. The FDR is an aristocratic brother from Hyde Park who was willing to commit class suicide because he had a commitment to justice. Nobody's met that standard. Now, people thought Obama would. Think again. No, no, he, Wall Street criminals went, were, were untouched, right? They got bailed out. Homeowners didn't. That's the first thing. Second one's empire. Who's keeping track of the drones? Who's keeping track of invasions and occupations? Are we concerned about those who are killed in our name? This is true in Yemen, mediated with Saudi Arabia. We can go on and on and on. Those are the two crucial issues that I begin. Now, what does that mean? That means it's hard for me to find a candidate in the truncated, corporate-dominated, electoral political system. But I still have to choose, because not to choose is to choose. <laughs> right? So I ended up with Brother Bernie again. I said, oh, Bernie, I'm critical of you in terms of empire. But my god, I like your critique of that monopolistic power at the top. Not because you hate brothers and sisters on Wall Street. They are made in the image of God. I know you and I think it in this because I'm not planning for folk to go to hell. I, I, I know that was metaphoric and literal on your part. But that, that we got a different sensibility. That's all right. We're still comrades. You're just wrong about that. And you think I'm wrong about that. And we go to fighting together. But those are two crucial criteria. The third is going to be how do you deal with patriarchy? homophobia and transphobia. The weakest in our society are the precious trans folk. They are the most trashed and dismissed, you see. So as a Christian, concerned with that cross, the most vulnerable, how do we acknowledge they are made in the image and likeness of God? Regardless of our policy disagreement, they are not to be trashed. Their dignity is not to be violated. This is where our commitment to dignity comes in. So those are the criteria I look when it comes to candidates, but I'm much more concerned with movements and awakenings than I am with candidates. Hmm. Because it's amazing in the history of this empire that we have so many citizens of unbelievable creativity and imagination and intelligence, and you look at the politicians we end up with. And you say, what kind of hemorrhaging is set in that all of that creativity gets diluted by the time we get to these politicians. That's a sad statement in terms of the future of a democracy. But we've got some new ones coming along. We'll have to see. Yeah. We'll have to see. That's just a short, Thank short you. <laughs> answer to your question. Do you want to say a word on that, though, brother? Well, maybe just a word, which uh, is, uh, is, is to quote the Bible. Uh, That's always a good yeah. start. Uh, place not thy trust in princes. I mean, there's an awful yes. lot of tendency yes. Yes. to think that it's politicians who are going to solve our problems. Yeah. I, I wish that things were in such a condition uh, that politicians could solve our problems. That would mean things are not all that bad if politicians could solve yep. our problems. Well, we had a Lincoln yeah. coming down there's the pike. Deep, that would be a good thing. What well, would be useful? <laughs> but there's a deep problem, as there was in Lincoln's day. There's a yeah. deep cultural problem, not only a cultural divide, but in my opinion, a very deep cultural problem, a loss of the sense of what the foundations of human dignity are. I think an mm. anthropological mm. problem, a loss of an understanding of, of what it means to be uh, a human being, and it's 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 not one that's going to be solved 
by politicians. Now, yeah. think about Roosevelt. Think about Roosevelt. FDR, not Theodore. FDR, mm -hmm. FDR. So, mm -hmm. Ro so Roosevelt, this is going to tell us something about political figures and princes. Yeah. princes. Roosevelt is the guy who executed the plan to put the Japanese Americans and Japanese legal residents in concentration yeah, camps in Oklahoma. That's true, he was so wrong. Do you know, maybe folks in the audience know, at whose request Roosevelt and the Democratic Congress took that step? At the request of a Republican governor in California named Earl Warren. Mm -hmm. Earl Warren, mm -hmm. who wrote Brown versus Board. That hero, Earl, uh, Earl Warren, yeah. he requested the internment of the Japanese. That hero, Franklin Roosevelt, he carried it out. That's true. And when the thing went to the Supreme Court, the, deprive, the depriving of these innocent people of their liberty and property, their property was taken, their homes were taken, their business was taken, without due process of law of any kind. Right. And it was upheld in the case of Korematsu against U.S. Who voted to uphold this policy? The great civil libertarians, all appointed by Roosevelt. Mm. Alex Frankfurter. Mm. William O. Douglas, Hugo Black. Mm. And just to put the cherry on top of this Sunday, and, and I, I didn't know this until Steve Breyer, Justice Breyer, pointed it out to me, who in American politics, what American political figure opposed the internment of the Japanese? J. Edgar Hoover. Mmm. Even a clock is right twice a day. Well, exactly. <laughs> you don't want to. Even a clock. You don't want to. You want to write. You know. You don't want to write people That's off. Right. They're going to be right. like pure evil or know. pure good. That's right. Earl Warren, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Felix Frankfurter, Hugo Black, William O. Douglas. Yeah. Wow. That's human fallibility well, right there. Yeah. That, I, can, I see that. now why this uh, original interview went more than an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in thanking our guests. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> oh, my brother.